All right, we are back from executive session. Uh, we are on the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? No, no items have been pulled, so is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved by Deputy Mayor, seconded by Council Member Agnew. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. Passes unanimously with Council Member McAuliffe absent excused. Uh, first, uh, yep, yeah, uh, we're on to public hearing. So AB 18-010 public hearing considering adoption, adopting interim tree uh, retention code amendments. I'm officially opening the public hearing and we have a staff presentation by Mr. Blackburn. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you, Laura. This is of course a tree retention code amendment and the purpose tonight is to consider a planning commission recommendation that would implement an interim, we're kind of calling it, amendment to the tree retention regulations contained with the Baltimore Municipal Code, Chapter 1218. And these infant measures would be applied until the city is able to do a more thorough or comprehensive analysis of its existing landscaping regulations that are contained within 1218 as well. If that amendment is a processed and approved through the 2018-2019 docket area. Now, council began consideration of the planning commission recommendation in June of 2017, but at that time decided to focus its efforts on a clustering code amendment that was also being considered and decide to hold the tree retention code amendment until a later date. But there continues to be considerable interest in uh, amending the city's tree retention regulations by adopting these type of interim measures that would address a number of shortcomings that the planning commission identified in its findings of fact. Now, the Bothell tree retention is again part of the landscaping chapter of 1218, and it's also based upon a percentage of the total diameter inches or the width of significant trees, and those are trees that are eight inches in diameter or greater, um, at measured four feet above ground, that are on the development site. Now, tree retention is actually not based upon the number of trees, it is the measure of the tree inches. And that's one of the areas that kind of confuses some folks. The current regulation requires that 10% of the total, tight, total diameter inches of significant trees within a development site be retained. And the Planning Commission, has, again, has identified a number of concerns with those provisions and is recommending a number of code amendments to address some of those concerns. Now, there's a number of terms I'm going to be using this evening, so I just want to kind of identify what those would be. Again, significant tree is a tree that is eight inches or greater in diameter at four feet above ground. That is basically any tree excepting alderwoods and cottonwoods are identified as significant trees. And again, the measurement is the tree diameter inches. And in fact, this example is, is like basically you've got a tree that you've kind of cut right in the middle at, at four feet above ground. This tree happened to be 20 inches. That's the number of diameter inches that tree is, basically has. So the concept would be if there were four of these trees on a piece of property, you'd have 80 diameter inches. One of the other terms that's gonna be used tonight is gonna be kind of basically pretty, pretty in depth and kind of wonkish, I have to admit. But basically here's what we have. This is an entire piece of property. This pre property has some critical areas, a stream and a wetland on it that are one, deducted from the net, from the, the gross area. These critical areas also have some buffers that are applied. Basically, they're again deducted from that total site area. Finally, a new roadway would have to be installed to service the development. That also is deducted from the uh, total area. That basically means what's called the net buildable area, and that's the area shaded in blue. That is the area where you can put buildings, put lots, infrastructure, and all those kind of uh, facilities. That is the area that the Planning Commission is basing its tree retention, um, retention provisions upon. Now, one of the things we did, and again, because visual illustrations work really well in this area, is we had identified a couple of test sites that we decided to look at. And one, of course, is kind of a smaller site with a bunch of existing trees. The other is a little bit larger site, again, with some critical areas on it. So we can kind of evaluate how that might impact tree retention. And basically what you can see here is that all of the trees on the property are assessed and measured. And you come up with a total number of diameter inches for the piece of property. On the side on the left, the smaller one is 280 inches. On the side on the right, it's a bigger one, it's 787. Now that's how many diameter inches are within the net buildable area. If you take the entire site, 
is about 1,258. So that's where this kind of comes in play is that this difference of um, how you apply these provisions. And again, one of the things that we got to remember is that within critical areas, 100% of those trees are saved. No tree is going to be removed from a critical area. That's underneath our critical area regulations provisions of Title 14, Chapter 4. We also created another site that kind of shows some of the infrastructure challenged areas that we kind of can face with. And this is a situation that actually we run into quite a bit. And basically the concept is that there's a lot of areas where we have a lot of trees. Okay, yeah, we can pull it to the site. This is an existing site, but we run into problems with, with basically infrastructure requirements, roadways, surface water, and locations for utilities, utilities and things of that nature that makes sometimes retention of those minimums, whether 10% or 20%, almost infeasible. And this is basically how these code would be applied currently. This is the 10% re retention requirement now. So what you can see is the site, the smaller site, has one tree of 30 inches that meets their entire requirement, basically 10% of 280. On the right, again, 10% of those 887 uh, inch diameters basically results in about five trees that be preserved at those numbers, basically 90, uh, 88 uh, diameter inches. The Planning Commission recommendation would essentially double that number from 10% to 20%. However, the interesting thing is that because the tr selection of which trees to be uh, uh, um, chosen is a little bit flexible there, it wouldn't necessarily be on the smaller site, the 130 inch cedar, it might be two or three other trees on the site. So that's one of the things I want to kind of show with this illustration. And on the right, the larger site, you go from basically um, you know, from five trees up to nine trees, and that satisfies that 20%. So you can see there is a market difference in the number of trees that would be preserved. Within multifamily zones, the Planning Commission has a kind of an alternative tree retention provision that I kind of wanted to illustrate with this. Again, on the left is a basically a site that would provide the full 20%. On the right would be implementing one of the Planning Commission's alternatives, which is to install new trees instead of having the pre total preservation. Now the Planning Commission recommendation would limit that to a very certain percentage of the uh, basically trees, basically 5% of the 20%. So essentially what would happen is that they would still have to preserve existing trees, but they could have new trees that would meet some of that standard. In this case, I'm showing four new trees at basically two inches uh, per tree. That basically gets you to the eight trees. Now, again, I touched upon this a little bit in the staff report quite a bit, but I kind of want to emphasize it again. Staff is recommending that there's a, be a provision added to the, uh, the regulations, and that's in the, ta the attachment four to the agenda bill. That basically says only if, and it's very important that we have only if, and then it's in consulting with the uh, consultation with the public works director and the community development director that infrastructure standards, and we're talking streets, surface water utilities, and things of that nature, make tree retention infeasible then an applicant could apply the alternative retention provisions and or mitigations. sometimes you can find people guide, that the Planning Commission crafted. And basically, I know there's a lot going on with this particular diagram, but essentially what you can see here is that, again, you put the roadway where it has to be, you put the surface water where it has to be, in this case, this is probably the lower part of the area. And then also you've got some utilities that have to be installed, you know, things like cable TV, uh, telephone, you know, um, now, uh, all kinds of those kind of things would go basically behind the right-of-way, about in a 10-foot easement. So essentially what you have there is you have some trees that would be in that right-of-way that wouldn't actually be in the net buildable area, and you have some trees that are right where those utilities have to be. In this case, preservation of that 20% is basically infeasible. You'd have to search for an alternative, and that's where staff is making that proposal that, okay, we have this catch-all situation where we do have uh, a development where we have no really other choice to, other than to do with the mitigation of new trees or save a lot of smaller trees, which is also a, a possibility. Now, today we've received some really good council questions about a number of items, but one question in particular I think that would be important for the council to discuss, and that is should sites with critical areas or buffers be allowed to credit some, all, or whatever it happens to be of their trees within those areas to meet the inch diameter requirement. And as we all know, most lands available for development now have a curricular area or a curricular area buffer. We know that trees within curricular areas are 100% required to be retained as we are now. And also, developments have to deduct 
critical areas and buffers from their site area. And that basically means they can't use those areas for surface water facilities, they can't use those areas to calculate hard surface requirements, they can't use them for lot area, and they can't use them for lot yield. So basically those areas are areas where they just can't do uh, essentially anything with it other than preservation. Um, one of the things about it is that if you want to cloud, allow trees within critical areas or buffers to be, uh, you know, count against the tree retention minimums, that's kind of a aesthetic and policy decision more than it is anything else. Because, you know, there's really nothing that says, yeah, there's a certain number that makes sense here, or 25 or 30 percent or 50 percent or something like that. It basically be along the lines of what the council believes makes the most sense from a community aspect. And we do propose that the council look at a couple options. One would be allow the 5% of the tree retention to be within critical areas and buffers, maybe up to 10%. We wouldn't recommend more than 10%. The beauty about if you do the 5% is that you still get within the net build-up area a 15% pre, uh, preservation, which again increases the number of trees within the net build area, which is basically the objection of this particular code amendment. So I do have some language, I've pressed it here again, it just depends on if the council's interested in it. Basically this would say, okay, if that 5% that would be allowed within the, the critical areas, or if it's gonna be 10%, we just basically plug in the correct number there as we so desire. So um, I just wanna show you what that would look like on our larger test site. And basically what this says is, underneath the 20%, there would be two trees over in the corner here that would be preserved. Well, those trees would be allowed to be removed in favor of assigning three or more trees within the critical areas to meet that. So you would see a small reduction in the number of trees within the net builder area, but again, it would be greater than the current standards. So at that point, I'll stop my presentation and allow you to go with public comments, questions, deliberations, and voting and vote, hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a sign-up sheet, but I don't have anybody signed up. Did, would anybody like to provide public comment? Oh, and I'm sorry, we have David Vliet, the chair of the Planning Commission here, to be in case there's any questions about the Planning Commission's discussion. Okay. No public comment? Okay. Um, so, let's go to council questions or deliberation, whichever. Maybe questions first. Good on this side. Is this just for questions about um, allowing to use uh, critical areas in that, or, I, or in total? Is question it in total? Yeah. I only have one question out of um, this whole discussion on tree retention, <coughs> and that was on agenda uh, page 149 when we were, because Planning Commission was concerned, had talked about, you know, someone who's going to sell a piece of property, they might want to you know, before or after the fact, are those trees vulnerable? And after the fact was one of those topics of how do we protect trees from, that are preserved when something's built, but someone comes in, buys a property, and, and takes down a tree that was intended to be saved. So my question to ask you, your opinion, uh, looking at what different municipalities have done, one thing that Kirkland has done uh, is that they require any new houses that are five years or younger to have a permit first before they bring down any trees. Your opinion is, is that, would that fall under this category or would that be under a separate category of permitting trees being cut? Well, in fact, one of the things that's interesting about that question is that it covers a number of different areas. And one is, as you identified, we'd have to create a new permit type as well as, of course, we'd have to identify how we would track those things. We're a little bit worried right now about how we would be able to administer that type of an approach right now because we've got, we're kind of limited on our staff resources and we don't have that provision set up. You know, that's the kind of really awesome thing that we could talk about if we do a comprehensive review of the landscape code because we could actually look at our permitting provisions and maybe there are some room for some, some new types of permits. And basically the idea would be that That'll give us a chance to kind of analyze how that would impact our staff resources as well as identify what the best way to do that is. But Kirkland's approach is intriguing. Deputy Mayor. 
So I wanted to thank you <laughs> for answering all my questions, but um, I received it late, so I'm kind of trying to, to catch up, and I'm wondering if it's possible for you and for everyone else's benefit to maybe go through my questions a little bit, what they were, and, and then your responses, only because I don't know if everyone had an opportunity to read them, and I think they're definitely worth Right, and unfortunately Hearing. I left my copy in the office. Oh, okay. So uh, Interim Director Hassler is going to bring me one so we can go through those. I appreciate that. You bet. Ah, uh, thank you, okay. Um, one of your questions was, um, land with a development site, our current code is the same as MIT buildable area. You were kind of questioning about, that was one of the really important things that the Planning Commission did or their recommendation was, okay, Let's nail this down. Let's identify what it is exactly we're going to measure. And that was net buildable area. And again, the net buildable area is such an important concept in the city of Buffalo. It's what almost everything is based on. The number of units, the number of lot areas, a lot of those hard surface provisions, a lot of things are based upon that. So it made the most sense to have, uh, tie it directly into that. So that was a good question. So they are the same effectively or no, not? No, they are not, They're not the same. Okay. Yeah, see, and okay, that was yeah. why, and, and see, Because it, it wasn't clear to me. Exactly, and that was part of the concern that we had is that in the current zone, it kind of talks about development area. Well, that could mean a lot of things, but it makes the most sense to say, okay, it's going to be the net buildable area. We're going to base it upon the overall philosophy the city of Buffalo is applying within that area. And then you say, in other words, are we simply upping the percentage of trees retention from 10% to 20% with the same base numbers of trees? And that's kind of like a yes and a no. Mostly yes, but partly no. And it's basically because the tree retention does go up. We go up from 10% up to 20% depending upon the situation or 15% depending upon if you have some of these alternative provisions available to you. Um, and let's see. Uh, so what I say, I'm just kind of going through here. Oh, one of the things I thought was interesting is that we currently have a director's interpretation and a hearing examiner decision that basically says, look, you need to use uh, net buildable areas. So one of the things that the staff has already done, that's why I'm saying mostly no, because we actually are already doing some of that stuff right now. We actually are measuring them against net buildable areas. So that's been something that we've been doing. Um, and how many of the sites, oh, uh, the developer land left, how many sites have sizable critical areas with, with them? That's a really I know, it's variable. tricky. But <laughs> I, know. I think that it's safe to say that <clears throat> most of the sites we're getting now have critical areas of some type. And uh, do you recommend, like, I, I was trying to find a way, because I assume that if there are critical areas on the site, that the, it already presents a challenge to the developer. It does. And so in, in wanting to recognize that, I, that's where I came up with the idea of perhaps we make it a smaller number, like 15% instead of 20. However, um, it seems like there should be some sort of threshold. It can't be, um, oh, we have a little five-foot square area of wetland and that counts, right? And so uh, I guess my question would be, I just came up randomly with the number of 10%. Mm -hmm. Does that number make sense? You know, I think maybe what you might be in good shape is that I don't even know if we have to have a certain size of curricular area because if you still have to meet your 20% and you cap it at 5% within the, the buffer or something like that, if you have a little tiny teeny so you, curricular area, not, you're not going to meet the 5% okay. of retention. So I think that if you do cap it at a number, mm -hmm. like 5 or 10% or whatever it happens to be, that would be your basic protection. Okay. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and then the other question I had was, oh, just I thought there um, were some really great suggestions from um, Interim Director Hessler, and I just wanted to, to be sure that that they had all been addressed. Um, yeah, and matter of fact, uh, the items that uh, Director Hassler identified were the basis behind the Planning Commission's recommendation. In fact, one of the things we did is we kind of, uh, check, 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 check. Oh, we forgot this one, go back and check. Yeah, anyway, so it was a really important fundamental. And that was uh, based upon what the Development Services staff was identifying to us, you know, Director Hassler as well as myself, is okay. We need to take care of these things because these tree retention regulations are becoming really tough to administer. And it was getting into one of those kind of almost shouting matches between developers and what staff as to what it actually meant. So one of the important things was to make the regulations as clear as possible. And then could you just um, briefly review 
the staff recommended changes um, from the planning commission recommendations, just so we have a clear idea of what those differences are. Yes, and that's in attachment four of your agenda packet. And basically it's the areas that are identified in yellow. The significant change is the one where we would allow infrastructure challenge sites, I'll use that term, to uh, have the alternative methods for immediate tree retention. The others are very straightforward, okay, adding a couple words here and there just to help clarification. One of which is in one, in one section we identify, okay, existing trees and, and new trees. I wanted to make sure it was retain the existing trees and install new trees, not, you know, so they could be confused and some really minor changes like that. Nothing, nothing beyond that other than a couple of word changes here and there. I thought it was significant only because um, one of the letters we received from the master builder said, please take staff recommendations. And so I was trying to fi figure out what, um, I guess it, it must be the infrastructure. I think it's the infrastructure. Piece. Yeah. And that's a, this is a, a, a problem that is, is pretty well known with, with our current regulations is that there really is not a really good, clear way for us to say, okay, where well, we have to have a roadway here and where all the great trees are located, they're gonna be gone. There's just no choice there. I think that's what they were talking about is those situations where we're all stuck. Okay, well I really appreciate your work on this. I understand you did a lot of overtime um, in, in bringing this to us, so I, I just wanna show my appreciation. Well, you're welcome, thank you. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you, I, um, I had a, a question surrounding the, the, the sites that were restrictive and if not feasible, they can go to the alternative plan. Um, what, who classifies something as not feasible? Well, and what we try to do in this, the code is identify that if there is an issue, then the community development director would collaborate with the public works director. And that's basically where you'd say, okay, does this roadway really have to be right here? And the community the public works director says, yes, our staff, people are identifying there's a site distance problem, for example, or no, it has to be at this location because of these factors, as well as, of course, surface water. And again, surface water is a little more limiting, but you have to put it into the lower part of the, the, the area. What you could have is a discussion about how big that is, and that's part of it. So when we have those mandatory infrastructure provisions, we wanna make sure that the two departments collaborate on whether those are actually feasible or not feasible. And a lot of times what it is is, is that, I mean, nobody likes the outcome when you have to do, remove some trees that are just in the way of some facility, particularly utilities. Do you recall what we did um, in Fitzgerald? Well, see that Fitzgerald was a little bit different because we were relying, relying upon a clustering provision to save the trees. Mm -hmm. And that's a really different aspect here that we don't actually don't have to worry about that now because it's in place. But the concept behind the Fitzgerald was, we said, okay, we will allow this clustering and we require that clustering to be in that location. That was a mandatory provision within that uh, zone. What about the infrastructures? Well, the infrastructure had to comply with that clustering provision. Just like right now in our clustering regulations that apply citywide, we have a bunch of flexibility been into the infrastructure standards so that the roadway can be narrower, doesn't have to be quite as long, you can make it a lot smaller. All those things come into play that let, let it be a lot easier to do a um, basically tree retention. In this situation, we had to create this craft this code so that it would be compliant with clustering as well as non-clustering. So basically the idea is that we're not gonna do a clustering PUD, we're just gonna build it pursuant to the underlying zoning, which you know, maybe by 9,600 or 8,400 or something like that. They don't have that flexibility built into it. Mm, okay. And then you, um, you had showed a slide where um, they had, you had moved the trees from, removed the trees from the site um, development area and showed them in the sensitive critical areas. Yes. Um, what, if I'm looking at this project, are those, tre the trees in the green, are they already existing or are you planting those? Those are existing within the critical areas. So if those trees, all the trees there now are actually there now in this, yes. in this diagram. Right. So would they be able to even take those trees out? In a critical area buffer? No, they would not. So I guess I'm in trying to make sure I'm understanding this. What we're saying is they're just utilizing some trees that are there, but they're not really, I mean, you're not using that your net buildable area. That's right. But we're allowing that as an alternative 
to give them a little bit more flexibility in the buildable, in the net buildable. Yeah, a little more flexibility to address those situations where, okay, they have perhaps very extensive credit areas <coughs> as, okay, well, I have to dedicate this land. I don't have any other there are benefits from dedicating this land. Maybe I can count a few of the trees up to 5%, let's say, or 10%, whatever happens, the number happens to be uh, within this area to meet those credits. Okay. And then uh, the last question I had is you had a slide there that showed the re retaining of one tree. Yes. And, oops, sorry. And that's one of the interesting things about the current methodology the city of Bothell does is it's not trees that are saved, it's diameter inches. And in many cases that can be met by saving just one tree, uh, particularly if the tree is large. And that was when that was changed about uh, six years ago, that was part of the concept was, okay, well, we want to save five or six or three or four little trees or we want to save one big tree. And there was a desire to have a mechanism by measuring site diameter inches and retaining a percentage of those site diameter inches, what would allow you to save that one big tree on the site. All right, well, unfortunately, you made me have another question after that, yeah, this one, but, but on that point, if we, if we look at, to me, I'm looking at this as a, maybe there's 20 trees clustered in an area, and you're gonna have a site development, and you're only required to keep this one tree for your development, you keep the one tree. The other trees that had been there previously were protected by the other trees in the cluster, and now we have this one tree solo standing out in the middle of nowhere, um, falls down on a power line or looks ugly because they got to tr you know trim it up. Does this does this new plan help to some degree that? Not exactly. However, one of the things that you'll look at in the planning commission, in fact, the planning commission spent a lot of time on this, is creating new tree selection criteria that basically said, okay, tree preserve trees in a number of ways instead of just lone trees. It encourages more things like feathered edge. That's an important thing, and that's usually a group of trees clusters of trees. Those provisions have been strengthened within this code amendment. And that's the provisions that staff uses when they get a tree retention plan in. They say, okay, well, wait, here we have provision number one. Well, they haven't met that. Number two, number three, number they went all the way down to number five, which I don't remember what it is off the head. That says, wait, wait, the planning commission has identified that these trees are important and they've given the director more authority in this, this proposal to require the right trees to be saved. And that's basically a, uh, based upon an evaluation that we're requiring also to have. That's a new provision here as well, is to clarify what requirements we have for a submittal. They have to be assessed, they have to be evaluated, they have to be understood what they are. And the idea behind it is, okay, developer, you've got your expert out here, an arborist or a forest practices expert, who's identified that these trees over here are great to save, these aren't. So let's look at the trees that are important to save or can be saved easier. So that's a real big part of this uh, particular uh, planning commission recommendation. Okay, and I liked what you said about the landscaping piece because I think, um, I don't know what the discussion was at the planning department, planning commission about the, the overall, but if you, if you take out 20 trees and you only have to save one, um, what is it really going to look, what are we creating, right? So, so I appreciate that. And then the last one was, you had mentioned an eight inch, eight inch diameter was the criteria. Yes. On a typical tree, how long does it take for a tree to get to eight inch diameter? Well, there's no such thing as a typical tree. However, a fast growing tree will take maybe about 20 years to get there. I'm um, uh, say that one more time. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a fast growing tree will take maybe 20 years to get there. 20 years to get to 8 inches. If you have a super fast inches. growing tree like Leyland Cypress or something like that, you're talking 15 years. If you have a slow growing tree, it may take, a ginkgo, for example, is a very slow growing tree, it may take it 100 years to get there. So there's that much variability within depending upon the tree species. Right. Okay, great, thank you so Sorry, much. Sorry, I wish I could be more clear, but it's, fine. it's hard. Yeah. Got some Olson, sorry, Councilman Olson. <laughs> it's the first time he's talked. So, so in the Good. oversight of when a developer or contractor comes in with a plan and you were speaking about a utility or a detention vault or pond, and there may be more than one location, but they just happen to place it where a cluster of trees is. And so is there pushback from the department to say that, you know, 
we know that you can go either way here and we'd really like to have it over. Yeah, and in fact, and that's one of the things where, where strengthening the approval criteria, the review criteria helps a lot. Because you can look at that review criteria and say, wait, if you have the ability to put a pond here or a pond here, usually you don't. Well, you're an you know that stuff. But usually you don't. Roadway sometimes is the one that's a little more flexible. And if you have that ability to move that, then the director now would have the authority to say, you have to relocate that street 20 feet or something like that to make that tree survive. So that, that's a much improved provision underneath these pr proposals. All right. Thank you. So I have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> the Master Builders Association plus King County Realtors have both sent us emails, one on Friday, I think it was Master Builders, and t today we got one from King County Realtors. Have those been in entered into the hearing? Yes, actually okay. uh, the um, Master Builders letter is number 19 and the letter from the King County Realtors is number 20. Okay, good. Um, so in their, in their letters, and this is an interim regulation, so it, I, I guess just kind of real quick, I think as a council and as a community, we're not real happy with what we're seeing in development. Uh, we see just basically just straight up clear cutting, um, it seems. I mean, that's the perception that people have had and that's why we're taking this interim step and there's plans to look at other maybe better methods in the into the future. But we're right now, today, we're just trying to, to I don't know, you know, whatever. Bump it up a little. Just try to, just try to have a stopgap measure basically to say like, we we agree with the public and the community that we need to do something now. Um, but again, there's stakeholders, and that's why I want to know, make sure the MBA and the King County Realtors' uh, voice was heard, because what they basically said was they really liked the um, uh, director's letter, which was Exhibit 2, uh, and they liked the recommendations he's made. And so my question is, I think it's attachment four, where you take the Planning Commission recommendation, and there's yellow highlights about staff changes. Are those changes reflective of what the director's letter has in here that need to be changed, or are there additional changes? Yes, I believe that is what they were after. Now, when I looked at their letter, I'm, I, I can kind of hear some of the, you know, not so sure about it, and that's the way I have. But I'm pretty sure what they were reflect, were talking about was attachment money for, particularly the infrastructure uh, conflict <laughs> provisions that we would implement, or potentially implement. Uh, I think that's one of the things that they believe is necessary. Okay, um, so uh, to that end, do you, f do you as, as your professional opinion, do you feel like us increasing the percentage of, well, making it net buildable area, making it crystal clear that it's net buildable area, right. and taking that to 20%, will that put a chilling effect on the um, housing market in the city of Bothell? Uh, will that put an effect on the housing market in the city of Bothell? We don't think it has that big an impact, honestly. Um, right now we require 10%, if we go up to 20%, and in our scenarios, we try to be honest with what was actually happening out there. We try to take sites that are very close to what we have actually been seeing coming into the, the city through the, the permit application process. And we're not seeing that huge an impact here, particularly for single family, and I know this is a little bit, a little bit tricky, but we have the clustering provision as well. And the concept would be that if they get into a, a developer gets into a situation where he can't meet the tree retention provisions. He can always go to a clustering provision and make his infrastructure smaller, make his lots smaller. All those things are available to him. That was something that wasn't available, well, even after, you know, before June, July of last year. So there's always an option for them to follow another way to comply. We do not anticipate this being some real significant impact upon our housing stock within the city. Okay. Um, and then I have one more question. So I have a friend that's a master arborist, which means something to arborists. And there's like the, it does. the upper shelf there. And um, what he, he let me know is that, um, well, first nurseries around here don't sell native trees that are, they typically don't stock and sell native trees that are as tall as being recommended. Like if you look at page 130 of our packet, it says replace one significant tree with one new coniferous tree, a minimum of 20 feet in height at time of planting. So those are very hard to find, and they don't actually sell them by height, they sell them by caliper inches. Caliper inches, right. So is this code gonna be something, you know, are we tell them to go bring us a rock and that rock's gonna be really hard to find, or is that something that they're gonna, developers are gonna be able to find, be able to purchase? I mean, obviously the market drives things, so if we put this in code, there might be a nursery somewhere around and say, hey, let's start right, growing right. larger native trees. Two ways to look at that. One is that the section you're actually talking about is where a development has removed a tree that was supposed to be preserved. 
And when the Planning Commission crafted that language, they said, wait, we don't want it to make easy just to cut down a big tree and replace it with a small, a six foot or eight foot or something like that tree. Mm -hmm. The commission thought that should be something that would be really extraordinary mitigation upon that impact upon the community because the idea is, again, this tree is supposed to stay here and if you remove it without authorization, and that was the real key in that is without authorization, you're gonna have to find a big tree someplace. Are, are they readily available? No, they are very difficult to find. And that's why part of the concept, the philosophy that was applied here was that we don't want it to be easy. We want it to be more difficult to mitigate for that lost tree. So that was part of the philosophy the commission put for. I actually did contact a couple of large tree nurseries and they did identify, they did have some of those in, in place, not a lot. So it will, be a, it will be a challenge if somebody decides to remove trees, unauthorized uh, tree retention, to get those kind of sizes. We can make an amendment to that. The council's thing is, yeah, we should make that maybe 16 feet and 20 feet. But again, the philosophy of the command commission was to make it difficult. And so, in any any new tree plantings, they don't have to be that big unless they knock down one of the trees exactly. they're, they're yeah. supposed to yeah. protect. Yeah, the idea is that the the really big sizes, and if you look at the provisions for RAC zone and sound like they're much smaller trees. They're 12 to 14 foot size, and that's pretty readily available. Uh, it's only if you were to do something like you weren't supposed to do with it. You have to put the really big tree in. Okay. Yeah, the guy I asked, he actually worked for a company called Big Trees. Big Trees, yeah. So I figured he knew what he was talking about. Um, so then just real quick, so the the version that I have to sign here, does that have the actual highlighted yellow changes that mm -hmm. you guys are recommending to the Planning Commission? Good question. No, it does not. Okay. That version is just the Planning Commission recommendation. Again, because the staff proposal is a little bit different when the Planning Commission, we wanted to make sure there was a real clear differentiation. Mm -hmm. So what we would do is we'd immediately pull, if, if the council decides to go with attachment four, we'd pull that into the ordinance and make that change. All right, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't sign the version I have tonight, but we can make, somebody could make a motion here uh, yep. to say like we approve the staff recommendation that's the modification of the Planning Commission recommendation. Yeah, yep. there okay. you go. Okay. Those, I believe, that those are all my questions. Does that spur any others? No. All right. Well, that was fun. So now we need to hear a motion, if there is one. Deputy Mayor? Let's see if I get this right. I'd like to um, move to um, adopt the proposed ordinance uh, attachment four um, with staff uh, recommendations. It's moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember McNeil to move attachment four, which includes the Planning Commission recommendations modified by, <laughs> with staff recommendations. Does that sound right? Okay. Is there any discussion on the motion? No. <laughs> thought you had discussion. Okay. Uh, go ahead and place your vote. Uh, passes unanimously with Councilmember McAuliffe absent and excused. We're done. Well, that was easy. Okay. Next on our, thank you, Mr. Blackburn. Uh, next on our agenda is, hmm? Oh, so that's the problem with having him down there. I can, can't hear him very well. All right, next is another public hearing, AB 18-011, uh, public hearing regarding code amendments to titles 11 and 15, making final plats in an administrative process. I'm officially opening the public hearing, and we have Mr. Blackburn again to provide a pre staff presentation. I didn't have to go very far. Basically, this is, and I'm not, I don't have a formal presentation on this one. Uh, this one is fairly straightforward. This basically to remove a process that has become duplicative or uh, unwarranted anymore. And that's basically holding a final plat closed record review before the hearing examiner on any final plat that happens. And of course, within the staff report, we go into great detail as to what's going on here. But just in a re quick recap, a subdivision, which is where a final plat would be, is a long process and involves a lot of public input, a lot of public provisions, pr provisions for uh, a comment, as well as participation of public hearing before the hearing examiner. But there is limitations on that, and once that subdivision is approved, that's it, it is approved. There's no more ability to come back and influence what was decided by the hearing examiner. 
what happens with the closed record review before the plan, final plan is that citizens come and say, okay, they get another notice and they've already received three or four already. They say, well, I wanna have this discussion because this is a public meeting, but it's a public meeting with a closed record review, which is an incredibly different way to look at it legally. And basically what it is is the hearing examiner will receive comment and testimony from citizens saying, I don't like this project because of X or Y or Z. And he has to explain to them, well, I'm sorry, but that's not testimony I can allow in a closed record review. You have to base your testimony upon the record that was established during the open record public hearing. So the concept is it's really tough for people to, to understand that. And it's what happens is the hearing examiner always approves these. And it's about five or six items he checks off. Yeah, 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 yeah. He basically goes to the public works department and the planning department staff and says, was this done? Yes, okay. Was this done? Yes, okay. And it's approved. And we believe this will save considerable staff time as this final step if we don't have to do this and make an administrative approval where, again, the, the public works director and the community development director both have to sign off as approval and then they would give it to the mayor, of course, for his final signature. But this would really save a lot of staff time. So I think I'm going to end at that and let you guys ask me questions. All right, uh, just real quick, is there, so I have another sign up sheet and nobody signed up. Is anybody here to provide public comment during the hearing? Seeing none, staff questions, or council questions? Staff, seeing none, is, oh, there we go. Councilmember McNeil. Thank you. Um, so, because I think if, if you've been through the process, you understand the review process, the timing, when you need to come in, when you need to appeal, those kinds of things. But speaking to the people in the community who see a sign go up um, and don't understand the process, on a subdivision, when the sign goes up, it's, a, it's an application. It is. Correct, so could you just real quickly, and doesn't have to be long lengthy, just explain that process and use it in terms of like a simple, Subdivision, it's going to You happen. got it. Okay. Basically, here's what happens. The first sign that goes up, the first notice that's issued is a notice of application. That's letting everybody know, hey, we got an application for a subdivision on this piece of property. That is posted on the site, it's published in the newspaper record, and it's mailed to people within 500 feet of that piece of property. The second notice they get is the SEBA, or State Environmental Policy Act, threshold determination that says, because of all these factors, usually it's basically the, the regulations we have in place, there's not a significant adverse impact with this subdivision. The third notice they get is for the public hearing before the hearing examiner, where the open record is established, where the hearing examiner receives testimony, he receives all the documentation, and then he goes away and he evaluates all this stuff and then issues a decision, whether it's approval or denial or a modification or whatever it happens to be. That's the process that's the open to the public. What makes this confusing is that the final plat is a closed record review, and that's where it gets really confusing to folks. So basically the idea is that most people have received at least three notices on this thing. They've had an opportunity to provide comment for months and months and months. They've had their input at the hearing, and many times the hearing examiner say, well, that's a good point. We think this project should be modified somehow, and I can't think about anything on top of my head. But that's the process where the public engagement is really important. The final plat is a checklist. Did they install the roadways? Yes. Did they put in the sanitary sewer? Yes. Was it to city standards? Yes. We're done. It's almost that, not, I'm oversimplifying, but it's almost that simple. So that's basically the process. In the meantime, what you've had is that after the approval happens, the actual project the subject is constructed. They go out and they install the infrastructure, the roadways, the utilities, and things like that. So there's not much doubt that the fact that there's gonna be houses going up here. So that's basically how it, in a nutshell. No, that, was, that was a great explanation. If members of the community want to get involved in the process ahead of time and want to have their voice heard, at what point should they be engaged prior to any approvals? Well, actually in many ways, we recommend folks to get engaged in this process, the code amendment or the plan process. Because there's a couple things that happens there. One, plan designations, what the density of the piece of property will be established during the plan process. The other is the code amendments, which or code provisions, which say, okay, what the style, and the heights, the building heights, and things like that. That's where people have their most effectiveness is where they do that. And unfortunately, we don't get a lot of that, but that's really where they have a lot of effectiveness. 
The other aspect is that during the open record public hearing where the examiner considers whether to approve the subdivision or not, that's another really good opportunity for them to come into play. Okay, so according to what you're, I guess what you're saying is this change in this process is a change to the back end after the approvals have already been made. Um, this is a final plat approval and usually done when all the utilities and stuff are installed. Um, at that point, there's no changes to the plat approval process. That's correct, yes. This is just mitigation paperwork behind the scenes. Yes. Okay. Um, and do other cities follow the same process? As a matter of fact, we're one of the very few cities that still has the hearing examiner approved final plats. In fact, the hearing examiner has often said, why are you guys the only ones, you guys being the city of Buffalo, the only ones who do this? He says, I'm happy to take the money, but everybody else does it administratively. Okay, thanks so much. You bet. So I just want to add on to what Bruce said from being up here six years. What what typically happens is that the um, we'll have requests by property owners to change the zoning on their on their plats, and that's usually if anybody lives next door to that, that's a pretty good signal that there's probably going to be some development activity there. So um, anybody in the public, if if uh, when we do we do it annually, and then we do it annually on purpose, so that it's just one time per year that you need to keep an eye on things. And I think the signs do go up when there's a potential code amendment or a zoning change for individual lots? Um, in general, if we have a property owner initiated, basically one or two property owners wants to have a change to their plan designation and their zoning, we do put a sign on that piece of property, yeah. as well as we mail out to people within 500 feet. And we do. We usually do have kind of a schedule to it too. It's usually like towards the end of the year, I believe, that we well, do the changes. You know, that's a good point, because it's almost always November, December. Right. So I guess just to that end, so if, if somebody wanted to keep t tabs on the, the neighboring property or something like that, that keeping an eye on what the calendar is of the council meetings and when we are looking at doing code amendments or zoning underlying zoning changes for specific properties, that's the best time to really weigh in and say, hey, I, you know, I don't want a five-story dormitory in my backyard. So yeah, let me sign. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I think we're done with questions, though. Nope. Deputy Mayor. I was going to make a motion. Okay, one second. Is, is there any other questions, staff? No? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I move that we adopt the proposed ordinance provided as attachment to approving code amendments, making the approval of a final plat an administrative process. Second. It's moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilmember Agnew to. Uh, Adopt the proposed ordinance provided as attachment to our packet approving code amendments, making the approval of a final plat an administrative process. Is there yes. any discussion on the motion? I'd like to speak to my motion. Um, I just wanted to say, I think this is one of those things that's, to me, it's almost a no-brainer. Um, anytime that we can have efficiencies where we're not spending uh, valuable staff time doing things that cost more money and really don't have a point, I, who wouldn't vote yes? And so I appreciate staff bringing this to us, um, and hopefully it'll pass. Any further discussion on the motion? Councilmember McNeil? Uh, I also will be supporting the motion, and I appreciate all your explanation on that. I think it's important that the community understand the processes that we go through, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, we do have signs up all over the city that are brown in color, um, that when there's something that's happening within our city, code amendment changes, things like that, they get posted on those signs, so. All right, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, go ahead and place your vote. Passes unanimously with Councilmember McAuliffe absent and excused. We're on to old business, AB 18-012, quarterly update on progress towards council goals, and the city manager has a presentation. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I'm just going to walk you through uh, the scorecard that's attached to this um, agenda bill and talk a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish um, really through this first year of the two-year goals that the council set for staff to work on. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the accomplishments. also want to highlight some things that we're going to be working on in 2018. Um, and to provide you with a platform to um, think about the things that we've been able to accomplish together in 2017, but also the things that you want to focus on and you want us to continue to work on as we meet in the council retreat on Friday. So we thought it would be a good opportunity to walk you through this. 
and answer any questions about things that maybe have been delayed or things that were accomplished or any other questions you have about the work that we did this past year and what we're planning to work on um, in the coming year. So on the first page under fiscal stability, um, in October you directed us to initiate work on a public safety levy, levy both uh, maintenance and operations as well as a possible capital levy. And so we're, that work is um, begun and will be a big initiative um, that we'll be working on this year. Sometime in the summer we'll come to you with um, a decision on whether you actually want to put that on the ballot or not. We'll bring you a tremendous amount of information um, both from the community process as well as analysis that staff does on um, the impacts of that levy. So that work is underway. Also under fiscal stability, um, the fi finance department has been working very, very hard as they always do. They've closed the books for 2017 um, and or for 2016 and 17, 17, sorry, what year am I on? 17, you closed the book for just closing 17. Um, we also had our audit um, for 2016. Um, and we brought to you um, in October, the time is going so quickly, in October an amendment to the budget and we'll be continuing to do that in 2018 as we make final adjustments for the 17-18 budget. Um, there are some things that we do need to talk to you about, um, some additional projects and some changes in that budget um, from when it was adopted at the end of 2016. For citywide technology, our technology department is on fire. Um, they have um, implemented several um, software packages over the last year. You made a $1.1 million investment in that, in that department in, in the 17-18 budget, and they have taken that very, very seriously and are delivering on that investment. Um, we, um, they have installed the financial utility billing software um, and are working on going live. Um, the most exciting component, I think, for the community is you're going to be able to pay your utility bill online. Woo-hoo! Um, that, is, that is a big, that is exciting for all of us. It saves a tremendous amount of staff resources. Currently, currently, you either have to pay by mail or you call in. And so that impact on staff resources, um, I think, will also be very positive. And um, we're looking at some other software upgrades. They completed the Parks and Rec, um, Blue Rec uh, implementation, and continue with Lucidity. So, uh, several um, packages in there and, and continue to move forward with um, just tremendous project management to get all of that done. City so Manager, could you explain Lucidity to the it's public? A, um, it's a um, um, asset management, I was like financial management, asset management program. So we're able to track all of the city's assets. So we started with um, facilities, utilities. Um, we're <laughs> moving towards Thank you very much. Moving, moving towards facilities um, and then into fleet. It's utilities, facilities, and fleet. UFF, I'll remember that. Um, and so um, for us to be able to manage our, our this, this, all of the city's assets, um, we hope to incorporate um, the, the fire department into that as well with all of their equipment and, and fleet. So um, a tremendous package for us to be able to do some important asset management for, for the city. It's, it's a best practice, a, a city our size um, with the quality of public works department we have, um, it's a best practice to have this kind of software package. Um, moving into safe streets and sidewalks, so on page three of the attachment, um, you, it's well underway. Um, we've been making quarterly updates and you will receive an update from the public works director on February 20th with um, all the information and, and everything that occurred with regards to the safe streets and sidewalks levy for 2017. It's a commitment that we made as part of this levy that we would communicate to the community what we've been able to accomplish and what we're doing with those um, funds that they've entrusted to us through this levy. Moving on to page um, five. So the Main Street Enhancements, that project um, was started in May of 2017. Um, we have experienced some delays, but we're expecting that the construction project will be complete at the end of February. So I want to make sure that, that folks understand that that's the bulk of the project. So the sidewalks are going to be open, the, the street lamps are going to be up, they're up now, they look fantastic, um, most of them are up. Um, the street will be open in both directions, so the actual construction, the, the main part of the project will be done at the end of February. Things like the plantings and the park benches and other amenities will be installed over the next couple of months through April. Um, just like we did on the multi-way, you can see we were we were really finished for many months, but we were adding the plantings and other things. And so we look forward to doing a ribbon cutting and, and having that complete for, for the spring and summer months on Main Street. Just to be uh, 
repetitive. Be sure to invite the governor to the ribbon cutting. Yeah, he does want to come. It was a, a huge help in, in obtaining the grant so we could do that project after the after the fire in 2016. Your next goal under page six, under community health for those in need. You've heard the police chief talk a couple times about the navigator program. This has been a really important enhancement. Um, it's a, it's a uh, mental health worker who's accessible to the police department. And when they do um, come in contact with, with individuals in our community with mental health issues, there's a professional there that can help that individual that, that the police officers can contact. That individual can work with that, that with those individuals with mental health issues and get them into care or treatment or connected to services. And so um, this is really an exciting program. Um, funding is limited, and so it may be something that we come back to you with, with our successes to see um, how we'd like to continue with that program and, and maybe even expand it in the future if we can really see the benefits of it. Um, other things are just connecting um, families um, with a new facility that's in um, Kenmore, Mary's Place. Uh, the staff from Mary's Place came and made a presentation to um, all the sergeants a couple months ago, really talking about the, the tremendous services that they're providing in the community. And so we want to be sure that we're able to um, get our residents that may need those services connected into that facility, which we're able to do. And um, some other things, um, sort of fun things, the animal control, our animal control officer with the police department um, volunteered for a pet food drive, um, which was done during the winter months and was able to collect some food and, and provide that to shelters that support um, homeless pets. On page eight, um, public safety strategy. Um, So um, this is for the fire department to measure emergency response um, against your adopted levels of service. We continue to look at response mo mo uh, models. Our chief is, is working on those things and that's part of our strategic plan. So he's been analyzing um, the response mo um, times and, and ways to improve that in our uh, different fire stations. Um, we did get the levy for um, Snohomish County. We got the six year, six year levy that occurred in the November election. Um, we funded the, uh, the council funded through our recommendation, the inspector position again, which began in January, on um, January um, 2nd in 2018. Uh, again, work towards the public safety levy and finalizing the strategic plan, which is a critical part of um, informing the, um, the public safety levy for the fire department. On page 11, um, we um, expanded our uh, stay out of drug area with approval of council. That's been very successful. We started with one and um, the police department and the courts found that to be so successful. They added um, several additional areas. So that's another um, improvement um, for public safety. And then on page 12 for community events and activities, um, we did initiate um, and, and implement a, a new tourism program that individual is working with the LTAC and will be coming to you with a work plan and a budget on the February 6th council meeting. Um, and um, along with events and activities, um, we, as you know, installed public art out front in City Hall, a, um, a longer term vision for some of our community members and, and those who are on our Arts and Festivals Commission. So the first public art around the City Hall area, um, a very nice accomplishment for, for the community. Um, we also added um, new kids music concerts, just kidding around for the summer, and they were just really, really well attended, and we got great feedback. Um, the record, the interim record coordinator who's doing that, Carrie, just super talented, and so we look forward to delivering those kinds of programs again in the coming summer. So it's not this. Um, for um, on page 13 under the Canyon Park Mastering Plan um, through a grant through the Port of Seattle, we were able to initiate that work. Um, that is a massive project as we did with the downtown sub area plan. That would be um, a, um, a revisioning of the Canyon Park. Um. Sorry, you're crackling pretty bad. <laughs> okay. Better? All right. The Canyon Park Master Planning. Um, so with an initial grant from the Port of Seattle, we were able to initiate that planning. We're asking for a second grant to do a financial analysis re with regard to that project. Um, and we've also put in a request to uh, one of our legislators for $700,000 to fund the actual um, entire project. And so we continue to move forward with that, which is our next major economic development redevelopment for the city of Bothell. 
On page 16, complete the downtown redevelopment. Um, this is um, a strategic part. It's a critical goal and a strategic part of our economic sustainability and continuing to implement the downtown sub area plan. Um, one of them is um, the parking um, management study. We brought that to you this last year. Uh, you approved phase two, and so we'll be working on that in 2018 to bring forward phase two of that project. Um, we are working with Sound Transit on the park and ride. Um, that's a very important project for Sound Transit to deliver to the citizens of Bothell. Um, we also sold the parcels right here next to the City Hall for a hotel development, and you recently approved uh, an extension for that uh, project with an expectation that construction will begin in June. Um, we stopped the um, work on lot on Block A or Lot A um, to have an opportunity to relook at that and see if there were other opportunities that um, were of interest to the council and the community. Um, e, F, and G also fell out of escrow, and so those are also waiting for um, a council discussion and a community discussion. Um, along with bot, uh, Block D, um, council did not extend that contract, um, that um, uh, purchase and sale agreement either. Um, so along with P South, we have four parcels in the downtown, A, D, E, F, and G, and P South, um, that are now fully within the city's control and we need to determine um, the future of those parcels. And so we look forward to working with the council and the community on a very open and transparent process on next step for these parcels, um, what we would like to see on them and be able to um, select developers that can um, really deliver something exceptional for our community. So uh, the assistant city manager and I look forward to bringing some of those things for before you in 2018. Uh, we continued work on the cleanup on both um, E, F, and G, and D. That is a huge effort, a very technical, um, very long process, and we made great strides um, in 2017 and hope to complete um, for both E, F, and G as well as D uh, the final, and receive final consent decrees um, for those parcels so that we can ultimately sell them and that construction and that development can begin. Um, affordable housing strategy that was mentioned earlier during public comments. Um, we look forward to bringing that to you um, in the first half of 2018. On page 17, the Wayne Golf Course, um, I wrote in big capital le letters, purchased um, an, a big accomplishment for the council and the community that occurred um, right at the end of 2017. Now we'll be working on a naming process with the Parks and Rec um, Commission, as well as initiating the visioning process of, of what we're going to do with the 84 acres. Um, under Parks um, Recreation Open Space Partnerships, um, we continue to work on those um, open space partnerships and, and um, with the community. Um, interim uh, Parks and Rec Director Tracy Prokoski will be doing a study session on, in April. Um, on all of the master plans, all the unfunded master plans, all of the open space and some potential open space the council has indicated they're interested in purchasing, um, how we fund that, what your priorities are, um, and, and really looking at all the opportunities and prioritizing um, our open space and parks within our community um, so we can continue to move forward and put our efforts where you want them to because there's so many needs when it comes to, to our parks and our open space. And then finally, on the last page, under citywide team building, training, and organizational development, um, it's one of the, the cultural um, investments that we've made within the organization is to really support staff development through a variety of training um, and really instill um, within the organization a culture of the values that we have, which are exceptional customer service, teamwork, innovation, safety, and ethics in the workplace. And um, I really feel that overall the culture and the morale um, have really moved in a very positive direction over the last year. And so um, that's, a, that's a pretty great list for 2017. And staff is, is really pleased. I'm very proud of the work that's been done um, through a lot of changes that have happened in the organization. And we look forward to hearing from you on Friday about 2018 and, and continuing to move ahead. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have some questions. I just I just wanted to um, say a couple things that um, as a council we decided, I don't, I don't know, I'm on my seventh year of being here, but for four years we really didn't have a list of goals. We just, I mean, we did stuff obviously, but the, um, we as a, as a council and as an executive leadership team, we worked together to create goals and I think we've shown, and this is the best document that we have to show how we've achieved those goals and worked to, towards those goals as a team. And I think it's really important, and I'm I'm really happy with the progress that we've had in this quarter. Um, 
I, I just, uh, I think this is a really great tool. So if there's people in the community that really wanna see like what is it that we're trying to accomplish as a city, this is the, the 14 pages of information you basically need to check every quarter just to kind of see what progress is being made uh, towards the council, I consider more than just the council goals, but um, you know, uh, the goals of the city basically. So um, thank you uh, for the summary. I think it's really important. And um, I believe Deputy Mayor, you had a uh, question? I did. Um, so I was just uh, curious about on page 14, the transportation impact fees and what that um, entails. It's under complete downtown redevelopment and it basically says transportation impact fees evaluate alternatives to existing Bothell Municipal Code and target completion date 2 4 2017. So uh, one of the things the council had asked us to do was take a look at those impact fees as, as businesses are changing in the downtown. Um, what impact um, does that change in use have on basically traffic? And so staff has recently done that. Um, we're, we have an analysis and we're gonna be bringing forward a recommendation for some changes in those impact fees. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Sure, <laughs> Councilor McNeil. Um, I think I said this before, but I would like to say it again. Um, I've seen a dramatic change in the way it feels to walk into this building now and after being here for two years, I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart for everything that you guys are doing for the city. So thank you and applaud you for all your hard work. Any other comments? So the uh, council retreat, we're gonna revisit these goals and make sure as a, as a new council that um, if there's new goals to add or maybe ones to take off or whatever, we'll, we'll be working on that. Uh, we have our retreat this Friday. So, and then obviously we'll come back and publicly that, that that'll be established. So that's a, um, but people are welcome to the, be at the retreat too. It's not like a, you can't, you can uh, watch, but you can't really be involved, so. Um, okay, I think that's it, except we have, that is it, right? Yep. Uh, so we have an executive session. We are gonna come back probably after the executive session um, and likely take a motion. So um, we're going to uh, go to executive session pursuant to RCW 4230-1101-I. Uh, it's the performance evaluation of the city manager. And so we're gonna, if we come, we can't come back early though, right? So should we say 45 minutes and then come back and extend it? Or is it better just to say an hour if we get done early, we can come back? How's that work? We got in trouble for this before, <laughs> didn't we? Yeah, I, I think the, the more prudent option would be to uh, do less time and you can always come out and extend. Um, but if you say an hour and we're done in half an hour and 45 minutes, then essentially the meeting's not over until the executive session expires. Okay, so let's do uh, 45 minutes. And so we'll be in executive session until, how's that gonna work here? Do we wanna take a break until 8.30 and then be in executive session until 9.15? That'll make the math way easier. <laughs> so we're gonna go to break until 8.30 and then we'll uh, return from exec executive session at 9.15.